everybody, this is Joe Joseph, and this is the DailySheeple.com's news shot. Well, ScienceAlert.com, it being Freaky Friday, says breaking an entirely new type of quantum computing has been invented. Now, interestingly enough, um, you know, quantum, quantum computing has been around for at least 10 years, if not more. Most of it was done in the universities, and then companies like D-Wave, IBM, got involved. Really, the, the industry leader is, is D-Wave, and they've made incredible advances in the realm of quantum computing. You know, there's some, there's some things about quantum computing, much like everything else the human race does. We get so excited about the capabilities that something might give, or what, say, um, a new invention might do, or a new drug that hits the market might benefit humanity. However, we never think or study oftentimes the consequences to bringing forth this type of technology. And I'll get into that in, in a second. It says here, Australian researchers have designed a new type of qubit, the building block of quantum computers. They say will finally make it possible to manufacture a true large-scale quantum computer. Broadly speaking, there are a current number of ways to make a quantum computer, so taking up less space, uh, some take up less space, but tend to be incredibly complex. Others are simpler, but if you want to scale it up, you're going to need to knock down a few walls. Now, some tried and true ways to capture a qubit are to use standard atom-taming technology such as ion taps and optical tweezers that can hold on to particles long enough for their quantum states to be analyzed. Other, other use circuits made of superconducting materials to detect quantum superpositions within the insanely slippery electrical currents. The advantages of these kind of systems is their basis in existing techniques and equipment, making them relatively affordable and easy to put together. The cost is space. The technology might do for a relatively small number of qubits, but when you're looking at hundreds or thousands of them linked into a computer, the scale, the scale quickly becomes unfeasible. Thanks to coding information in both nucleus and electrons of atoms, the new silicon qubit, which is being called a flip-flop qubit, can be controlled by electrical signals instead of magnetic ones. This means it can maintain quantum entanglement across a larger distance than ever before, making it cheaper and easier to build into a scalable computer. Now, that's very interesting. Now, the D-Wave, uh, last I checked, the 4096 D-Wave uh, was the D-Wave that's being used, or the quantum computer that's being used to control CERN and a lot of other uh, particle accelerators, not to mention the fact it's used at Google, it's used in as, at NASA. So, D-Wave, like I said, is really the front runner when it comes to quantum computing technology, but other countries are figuring out new and innovative ways to manufacture these things. Now, like I said in the beginning, oftentimes we bound fearlessly into this new technology without considering the risks that are involved and in bringing forth this technology and putting it to use on a widespread basis. I'll give you an example, and that's the cell phone. Now, the cell phone has been around for, you know, a long time, but it only recently became where, you know, basically everybody had one starting around 2000 and then on forward. Even before that, you know, a lot of people didn't have cell phones because you know, 10 cents a minute, there weren't uh, 500 anytime minutes and anything like that. It was a very expensive service to have and maintain. And then the smartphone comes around, right? Well, now everybody has one. No one took the time to do any studies to long-term exposure of low-dose radio frequency and its effect on the human body. And having these wireless devices, these wireless, you know, they're basically radio transmitters up to your skull for umpteen hours a day does damage over time because radiation is cumulative. Radiation dosing is 
cumulative. It doesn't matter if it's radio. It doesn't matter if it's gamma. Radiation damage over time is cumulative. And no one looked at the long-term effects of implementing this technology on a mass scale. So we don't know what it's doing to the human body, but we know that over the last couple of years, phone companies and cell phone manufacturers had made it a point to put RF warnings now in all their brochures or all their instruction manuals that come with the phones and instruct you do not hold it directly up to your head. They say hold it a quarter inch away. Well, too bad. We've already had 25 or 30 years where people have been doing that. And there's no telling what kind of damage or cellular damage it's doing to people. You know, people keep them in their back pocket all the time, in their side pocket. You don't know what it's doing to fertility. You don't know what it's what kind of effects it's having for birth defects. Nobody's measuring this kind of stuff. It's almost akin to vaccines, right? Vaccines we know injure people. But the injuries are so underreported because it's not studied enough because there's no incentive to study it enough because it's being pushed so hard that it's detrimental that you get vaccinated. And then the government, because it's so good for you and nothing ever goes wrong, gives the uh, big pharma immunity over vaccines and creates a vaccine court to handle all the garbage associated, all the damage associated with vaccines. And we still don't study it. Why? There's too much money to be made. Just like with cell phones. They know through, over the last hundred years, <clears throat> gentlemen like Edward Bernays, Clotaire Rapai, and others have really mastered the way to market things to people, to appeal to one's desires. And everybody, of course, desires to be less burdened, less troubled. And really, everybody buys into the culture of convenience. And why not? Hey, if I can make my life easier, why wouldn't I? So these are very dangerous things. Now, with quantum computers, what you're doing is, and the way that Jordy Rose explained it during a TED Talk, It's quite simple. You're creating basically alternate universes and connecting with the twin particle that has entangled, you know, that's entangled with on the other side, and you're pulling information back from another dimension, from another universe. Now, when you punch holes in our existence, in the matrix, in the veil, whatever you want to call it, once you punch a hole in it, it never goes away. And what are you letting through? Because remember, in our construct, we are limited because time is our prison. We are stuck in time. You know, we can't go and travel forward and we can't go and travel backwards. We're stuck where we're at. But there are entities out there that are not imprisoned by time and are able to travel through doors once they've been opened because once it's open it's always open to them so these are things that we have to think about and consider when we do this but it's things that they don't think about when they do this you know you look at things like the Mandela effect all byproducts of screwing with reality so things to think about Quantum computing will revolutionize life as we know it. However, we really need to consider the cost because I truly feel that between quantum computing and AI, we are fast on the fast track to losing our humanity. I'm Joe Joseph. This was the DailySheeple.com's news shot. Feel free to comment below and visit our website at thedailysheeple.com. Have a great day.